Stuff Podcasts. Hi, I'm Michael Wright, and welcome to The Long Read from Stuff. This week's story is called Road to Redemption. It's by Stuff senior writer Blair Ensor, who is currently on the road, working on another story that he assures me will feature on The Long Read at some point. Hi, Blair. G'day, Mike. Where are you exactly? Oh, I can't tell you that, mate. <laughs> it's too much information. <laughs> people might be listening. Uh, so this story is called Road to Redemption. It's about a group of people known colloquially as 501s. Some people might have heard that phrase before, but who are these people? So 501s is like a blanket term for people who have been deported from Australia um, in the last seven or eight years, and they, you know, Australia in around oh, late 2014 adopted a really hard line immigration policy, which has literally seen thousands of Kiwis uh, turfed out of Australia. So these are people with criminal records who were not born in Australia, yeah? Not all of them have criminal records. Um, some of them have their visas cancelled for character reasons, such as the fact that they may be affiliated or suspected of being involved in organised crime. Um, but predominantly, people have been convicted of crimes that have seen them jailed for more than a year. And this is, as people will probably be aware, quite a controversial policy. This story deals with some of the fallout from that. Tell us about that. Yeah, so obviously when you're deporting a group of people who many of whom have criminal convictions, that has you know a flow-on effect to us here in New Zealand. Some of them are very senior gang members. Um, some of them are quite serious criminals, like some of them are murderers, some of them are rapists. But there are also a number of you know other people who have much less serious convictions. Um, anyway, these people land in New Zealand. Many of them have spent the majority of their lives living in Australia and they come back here and they literally have nothing. They are isolated from family, friends, and they don't have a dollar to their name. And many of them have have found themselves before the courts here in New Zealand, like we're talking uh, more than half of deportees have uh, offended since coming back to New Zealand. But there are a few who have managed to carve out a new life in New Zealand and are, I guess, on the road to redemption. And this story deals with two of these people. So uh, just briefly tell us a bit about these two guys, Lee Tapuia and Mark Talanoa. So Lee Tapuia uh, is a high-ranking, or was, sorry, a high-ranking uh, Rebels gang member um, in Perth, Australia, and he was deported because of his apparent ties to organised crime. Um, and landed back here in New Zealand in late 2017. And Mark Talanoa has, oh, he, I mean, he has a pretty incredible story in, in Australia. He was sent there in his early teens, uh, I guess, chasing the rugby league dream. He and his sibling um, both got signed up for separate development squads. One of them made it. It wasn't Mark. And instead, he found himself uh, involved in some pretty serious crimes in Australia, which you'll read about. Um, and then when he was deported to New Zealand, he didn't want to kind of bring shame upon his family anymore. And I mean, his his road to redemption story is one that is that's pretty empowering. All right. Thanks, Blair. I'll let you get back to that other story you're working on. Here is me reading Blair's story that has a bit of swearing in it. Road to redemption. Lee Tapuia stood with his hands in the air as black-clad police officers ran towards him, guns drawn. Get on the fucking ground, an officer yelled. Tepuia was forced onto his stomach and handcuffed, as his primary school-aged children, looking on from their Perth home, screamed. Leave my dad alone, one of them said. He's not doing anything wrong. The previous day, September 6, 2017, Tepuia, a high-ranking member of the Rebels gang, had walked free from Perth Immigration Detention Centre after Australia's highest court ruled a decision to cancel his visa using secret information was invalid. But within minutes of stepping outside the wire, he learned Australian Home Affairs Minister Peter Dutton had used new legislation passed under urgency days earlier to again revoke his right to live in Australia. After hiding out at a friend's place for a few hours, Tapuia returned home and waited for the inevitable. 
his two-year fight to stay in Australia was over. Tapuia is one of nearly 3,000 people deported to New Zealand since late 2014, when Australia began hardline enforcement of a populist immigration policy. The deportees are known as 501s, named after the section of the Australian Migration Act that has allowed the cancellation of many of their visas. Most have criminal records, but others, like Tapuia, are deemed to be of bad character because of their association with bikey gangs and apparent ties to organised crime. New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern has described the forced deportation policy as corrosive to trans-Tasman relations. Many of those who are kicked out of Australia have lived there for years and on return to New Zealand find themselves isolated from family and friends. Without a job or stable accommodation, they often turn to crime. Some, of course, have made that a lifestyle, whether in Australia or New Zealand. The 501s have made New Zealand's gang landscape more complex, unpredictable and dangerous. Their names feature regularly on court lists across the country. New figures obtained by Stuff show more than half of the 2,651 people deported between January 2015 and April 2022 have committed at least one crime since their arrival. And with hundreds of others sitting in Australian detention centres waiting to be sent home, there were 254 at the end of May, advocates say more needs to be done to support 501s when they land in New Zealand. Better access to housing and mental health and addiction services are key, they say. But Kiwis also need to be more accommodating, particularly when it comes to helping them find work. The deportees have been painted as the worst of the worst. Murderers, rapists and child sex offenders. Peter Dutton has described the policy as Australia taking out the trash. But many of them have only relatively minor convictions for drug crimes and dishonesty offending. I think some of the inflammatory rhetoric in Australia around 501s has been really horrible and completely lacking in humanity, says Police Minister Chris Hipkins. Sometimes people fall off the right path, and there are consequences for that, but they do deserve an opportunity to have a fresh start. There are success stories among the deportees, but they don't come easy. Banished from Australia, despite having no criminal record there, Lee Tapuya wound up back where it all began, Blenheim. He had had a troubled upbringing in the small Marlborough town. He was the son of a gang associate and as a child was sexually abused by a family friend. In 2005, he left for Australia in search of a better life. Twelve years later, in 2017, Tapuya was back with no money, no stable accommodation and no job. His mother was dying of cancer. Several of his seven children were struggling with depression. He was isolated from the Brotherhood of the Rebels, the bikey gang he had dedicated so much of his recent life to, and haunted by an incident during his detention when a man asked Tapuya to help him kill himself. Now, Tapuya's own mental health was in decline. Even finding a job, somewhere to live and quitting the gang, didn't help. I'd pushed myself into a corner, he says, and that corner was getting darker and darker. At his lowest point, Tapuya contemplated suicide. I was about to take my own life, and I thought of my kids and my grandkids. They needed me around to get out of their dark times too. For salvation, Tapuya turned to boxing, a sport he had developed a passion for in Australia. He hung up a punching bag in his garage and slugged it out morning and night in an effort to clear his head. I took some shit out on my bag, he says, and I just thought to myself, it does well for me. A carpet layer by trade, Tapuya decided to teach boxing. Through a friend, he learned of several youths in town who were also down on their luck. They were among his first students. 
I was trying to mentor them and tell them my journey and my struggles in life, he says. It just grew from there. Two years on, largely through word of mouth, Tapuya's school of boxing has far outgrown his garage. He's got a trainer's license, his own gym called Box On Boxing, and more than 150 students of all ages. The gym is run via a not-for-profit charitable organisation called Box On Charitable Trust. Tapuya also shares his story in schools, is working with Sport Tasman, and drops in regularly to the local youth centre to spend time there with anyone who might need his help. I get real emotional when I look where I am right now, he says, because it's taken me a lot of hard work to get here. I'm still on my path to redemption. I've got positive people around me, and they keep me grounded. The 44-year-old is grateful for the support he's received from family and friends since being deported. They were the ones who helped him find a house and a job when others rejected him because he was a gang member and a 501. I'm one of the lucky ones, he says. There are many people coming home who have got nothing. Tapuya is reluctant to talk about his time with the rebels, which he left in late 2019. That's in my past. The patch meant a lot to me. When I was in the club, I'd given 100% to everything. But I couldn't do that anymore because I had to sort my mental health out. I really needed to be there for my family. I felt like they accepted it. For me, brotherhood is about being straight up with your brothers. It was hard. These days, Tapuya is focused on steering youths away from gangs. In life, we all have that hard road, he says, and we punch on or box on and carry on our journey in life. I've had a colourful life. This is my new journey, and it's going good. More than 300 kilometres south, Mark Talanoa, 33, is hard at work on a building site at a prestigious Christchurch secondary school. As a youth, Talanoa caused trouble on the streets of East Auckland, drinking, smoking cannabis, stealing cars and beating people up. He and his older brother, Fetuli, were also talented sportsmen. They were both awarded scholarships to attend Wesley College, which has produced rugby greats like Jonah Lomu. In 2004, their mother sent them to live with their auntie in Sydney, where she hoped they'd steer clear of a life of crime and instead make it big in the NRL rugby league competition. Fetuli secured a professional contract at 18 and carved out a career playing for the South Sydney Rabbitohs in Australia and Hull FC in the UK. Mark Talanoa buckled under the pressure to keep pace with his brother and turned once again to drugs and alcohol. He was plagued by injuries and eventually threw the game away, choosing instead to promote parties at nightclubs. He also started dealing methamphetamine, cocaine and ecstasy and fell out with a gang that wanted to tax his profits. During a meth fueled rampage, Talanoa set fire to the gang's headquarters, fired shots at the president's house and tried to blow up his car. The crimes earned him a lengthy stint behind bars. In 2015, two years before he was released from prison, Talanoa learned he would be deported and his partner, now wife, packed up her life and headed across the Tasman to prepare for his arrival. She sent me a map of New Zealand and asked, where do you want me to go, he says. I put a big X next to Auckland. There were too many temptations, too many boys in that space, and it would have been too easy to fall into old habits. Most of my mates who have been deported have gone back to jail two, three, four times, and it continues. I knew I had to make amends. Talanoa chose Christchurch and tried to approach life like he had a clean slate. But every time he applied for a job, a background check flagged his criminal record and he was knocked back. 
It was so hard to find work, he says. It made me second guess whether I should go back down that old path and start selling drugs. The system almost sets you up to fail. Talanoa resisted the urge and eventually found temporary work as a labourer for South Base Construction. After a year of sweeping floors, picking up rubbish and lugging timber, his reliability and hard work was rewarded with a full-time job. There's nothing fun about picking up rubbish, he says, but I knew that if I persevered, someone would sign me up. South Base Labour Manager Scott Kelly says employers need to sit down and meet people like Talanoa, rather than writing them off based on their history. People make mistakes, Kelly says. I took a chance on him. I knew there was a decent person in there. I knew I could get a lot out of him. Talanoa, a father of two preschool-aged children and a teenage stepson, is now a fourth-year apprentice carpenter at South Base. Recently, with the company's help, he established a charitable trust called Road to Redemption, which aims to help offenders and deportees reintegrate into the community with housing, financial support and mentoring programs. He's also regularly invited to share his story at events to inspire and give hope to others. We're not all bad, Talanoa says of deportees. There's a lot of people returning home and re-offending and doing violent crimes, but there are also guys and girls like me, trying to put our best foot forward. 501s should treat being kicked out of Australia as a new chapter in their life, Talanoa says. You've done the hardest part of your life being in jail and being deported, he says. Surround yourself with people that have your best interests at heart, who will keep you accountable. Supporting deportees when they arrive back in New Zealand has cost the country tens of millions of dollars. Those who have served a sentence of at least a year and been released within six months of their arrival, or if they were already being monitored in Australia, are usually subject to a returning offender order which means they have to adhere to parole-like supervision. Corrections contracts organisations such as Prisoners Aid and Rehabilitation Society to help find deportees housing, jobs and healthcare. Those who aren't subject to a returning offender order can also get reintegration support. Philippa Payne, the founder of the Iwis and Oz and Route 501 groups, has long advocated for deportees and says Tapuia and Talanoa are shining lights amongst the thousands of 501s. It's no surprise so many of those who have been exiled from Australia have committed crimes since crossing the Tasman, she says. The deportees are spending longer in more brutal conditions in detention centres, and when they land in New Zealand, they're treated like criminals and get little support. We subject them to conditions that are often detrimental to their mental health and their social well-being, she says. We need to extend our hands and offer support instead of sending them to the bottom of our social pit into emergency housing and then blaming the downfall on the person. Payne says New Zealand officials need to engage with deportees long before they're kicked out of Australia to find out what their needs are. I believe the majority of people who are deported, she says, come here wanting and willing to change their lives. They just don't know how, in an environment they don't fit. Police Minister Chris Hipkins says ensuring deportees have the support they need to rejoin society is absolutely a priority for the government. He acknowledges housing is a big issue. Police figures show re-offending rates among deportees in their first year are comparable to those who've been released from prison. I think we all need to recognise that if people have done their time, they deserve an opportunity to turn their life around, Hipkins says. If we continue to stigmatise people based on mistakes they've made in the past, then we actually increase the likelihood they'll make those mistakes again in the future.
That was Road to Redemption on the long read from Stuff, written by Blair Ensor and read and produced by me, Michael Wright. This episode was edited by Connor Scott. If you're listening via the Stuff website, you can hear this story and many more like it on the Long Read podcast, available on all the usual podcast apps. If you liked what you heard, please give us a five-star rating and a review. It helps other listeners find us. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.